Let's Take This Outside with Marianne Iveson, the podcast where she speaks to athletes, outdoor professionals, and scientists about why they connect with nature. James Appleton is the host of the 46 of 46 podcast, an outdoor storytelling podcast based in the largest protected wilderness area in the continental U.S., the Adirondack Park. The podcast chronicles his days on the trails in the Adirondacks and beyond in a unique trip report style format that is equal parts entertainment, trail info, and stories. James is a New York State licensed guide for hiking and camping, and when not on the trails, he's working in the film and TV industry, lifting weights, or at home with his wife and three girls. Please welcome James Appleton. James Appleton, this is a long time coming. Welcome to Let's Take This Outside. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been great chatting with you over the years on social media, and it's great to, uh, I remember when you started the podcast, and now here I am, so it's awesome. I think we connected when I first kind of started my voiceover business, but I saw that you love the Adirondacks. We both work in media. You're kind of in the film TV industry, right? In the audio side. And you had your 46 of 46 podcast. I'm trying to be a 46er. I listened to your podcast. I'm like, damn, the audio is so good. Mm -hmm. And we connected and then I learned, I'm like, oh, it's because you're a professional audio guy. So that's why it sounds so good. I appreciate that. And people always compliment me on the audio quality. And I always like, that's... That's what I get excited about when it's like, oh, I'm glad you noticed that, that, you know, I'm recording all of my podcasts on like film audio equipment because that's just what I have. Yeah. You know, I record most of them in a car, which is basically like a little makeshift sound booth. So when people actually notice, they say like, oh, the quality of your audio is really good. I say, thank you so much. You know, I'm like sweating bullets in my side of my car recording podcasts because it's a better sound booth. Uh, So it makes the work worth it at that point. Don't correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember listening in the like ambient sound of nature too. Like you'd pick up audio when you were hiking and stuff. So, you know, if you've never listened to my podcast, it's basically like, I mean, it's evolved to a lot of different types of episodes now, but when it first started, it was kind of like trail documentaries, like mini trail documentaries. And I would add audio from the trail that I recorded out on the trail. I, then I add sounds and I basically want to paint a picture. So like you feel like you're on the trail instead of sitting in your car, commuting to work, wanting to kill yourself. At least you listen to the podcast and you can you know, feel like you're in the woods, on the trail, summoning a mountain. Oh, there's a squirrel. Oh, there's a bird. You know, like That's kind of the, the experience that I try, to, I try to create. Well, I'm excited to introduce my, my listeners to your podcast because I think there's a lot of overlap in terms of how people enjoy nature. So first of all, like I want to talk about the podcast and the 46ers, but where did your love of nature and hiking begin? Like, did you grow up in Lake Placid? Yeah, so I grew up in Lake Placid, but uh, my actual outdoors, we'll call it outdoors career for lack of a better word, but my actually like taking advantage of the outdoors is what will define outdoors career as. As a kid, when you grow up here in this like kind of world, small town, right? Like all, what does any kid who grows up in a small town want to do? They can't wait to get out, right? Like they just, it's they, the world is so much better elsewhere. Yes, growing up here, like, the activities you do typically involve the woods or they involve lakes or they involve rivers. So like you always are doing those things um, because that's just like culture, but I never actually cared. You know what I'm saying? Like you see all these mountains all around town, anywhere you go, like you look outside the window of my high school and I don't think there could possibly be a better view in any high school in any town in the United States. Like you have the entire high peaks, like looking like they're 10 feet away from the high school. It's, it's crazy. Wait, wait, is it, is it the high school right by the oval track? Yeah, yeah. that's, that's, okay. that's the only high school, but yeah, that's the high school. To describe it. I'm sorry. I just going to say this to describe it. It's this high school right in the middle of town, but it's like one of the most pitch, like you literally, what you just said, it's one of the most pr- picturesque. I'm like, I would be so, I'm so jealous that people actually get to go to high school here. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I've had so many people be like, did you go to that school? And I'm, my answer is like, it's the only high school in town. Like, that's just like the public school. Of course, that's where I went. But when you don't know, exactly when you don't know, it's this like grand epic looking building in school with like the high peaks, like painted picture perfect directly next to them. Uh, but as a kid in school, you don't care. You're just like, it's, this is school. School sucks. I can't wait to leave. So I left like everybody did, went to college, did the whole thing. And then I was touring in a band for most of my 20s. And every time we would get out west, like Colorado or the Northwest, California, I'd be looking around like, man, this is like, this is it. 
look at all these mountains and the outdoors. And it's just like, oh, the reason you like that is because like it reminds you of home. But for some reason, these mountains count, but like where you grew up is meaningless. And it was just like, it was like a, a light bulb went off in my head. It's like, oh, maybe where I lived wasn't so bad. And then long story short, my wife and I eventually moved back up to this area to purchase a home. And, you know, she wanted to be much closer to family. So we came back and a couple years after coming back, I just basically started hiking because I was in much better f- shape physically at that point. And all of a sudden I hiked up a mountain and I made it to the top without wanting to kill myself. Whereas growing up every single time I ever went hiking, which is like pretty regularly when you live here, like you'll go up a mountain once or twice a year for this reason or that reason. I mean, even on school field trips, we did a hike up pitch off mountain. Um, <laughs> so like you get used to it. Okay. Yeah. I can't believe people do this a for fun and b like they'll do multiple mountains in a day. That's just wild. But it's because right. I was always way too out of shape for the activity. So all of a sudden when I, and this was all of a sudden when I went hiking and I made it to the top of a mountain, which was a medium sized mountain, a mountain called ampersand mountain. I couldn't believe it was like I made it. I was like, that's it. And Mm -hmm. that was like an unlocking where all of a sudden I'm in better shape physically and I can actually enjoy the outdoors now. And that was just like, that was the door opening and, uh, it took off from there. Um, I quickly finished the, a uh, little hiking challenge called the Saranac Lake six, which that mountain was a part of. And then I started the high peaks and, uh, now it has completely transformed literally every day of my life because I have, I have the podcast, which like created a business, which cr- now I write books about these mountains. And it's just like, it's pretty wild how it snowballed. And it was all because all of a sudden, like I could go in the outdoors and enjoy climbing a mountain without wanting to die. And that was just like, that was the catalyst. And then that snowballs into now you go paddling and you go camping and you like, you just really take advantage of everything there is because where I live in the Adirondacks, I mean, you're in the middle of wilderness. So there's just everything you could ever think of is, uh, you know, a mile away from my house. I want to describe, first of all, if people people always ask me, even from Ottawa, they're like, what is this Adirondacks? Like, what is this like magical place that you go to? So for example, if you're from Ottawa, it's about a three and a half, four hour drive. It's in the northern part of New York State. Uh, it's about a two hour drive from Montreal. And it's this magical place with about 46 peaks over 4,000 feet. And I want you to explain later what the 46 peaks even are. But I want to give paint a little bit of a better picture of what we're even <laughs> what this is that this magical place that you live. Sure. So of course you, you know, you love nature, you move back. What made you want to start the podcast? Did you know there was an appetite for these kind of resources? Or did you just like, I'm just gonna start creating it and see what happens this is just a fun thing? Yeah, sure. So the the podcast came like months after the fact. Actually, we'll rewind it slightly. So I actually started a hiking challenge in Lake Placid called the Lake Placid Niner. And it was solely because of a friend of mine. He's from Rochester and he's for Rochester, New York is like, I don't know, like five or six hours west of, of the Adirondacks of Lake Placid where I live, I should say. He's like obsessed with the Adirondacks. And I never knew growing up like that that's a thing. You know, to me, it's like, these are just little crappy towns like in the middle of the mountains. What do do you mean you're like into it? So I never knew that becoming, and I always knew this was a tourist area, but I never knew that it was a thing, like a brand all in and of itself. So I remember thinking that was very interesting to me. So that was kind of like one catalyst of the story. And then I started this hiking challenge that's called the Lake Placid Niner, which is like nine smaller mountains around the Lake Placid area. And the whole point of that is to get you prepared physically to start hiking the high peaks. So I had created this challenge because I'm the type of person, I have a podcast where I like like to create things. I'm very into creating things um, like any creative person Mm -hmm. is. So I made this challenge, launched it out into the world. It has been a huge hit. It still exists to this very day. In fact, I have to go open the PO box and get some envelopes literally this afternoon to start sending more patches out. Um, it's, it's this awesome little hiking challenge that helps people get in shape for the mountains, you know, smaller mountains around this area. So then go into the high peaks. So I climbed the high peaks 
in one summer after launching this challenge. And then a few months later, because of the Lake Placid Niner, I knew, you know, filling out registration form or filling, sending people their patches and hearing their little or reading their stories that they'd write on the registration, all was talking about like how much they love coming up here. They come up on the weekends and this and that. So between that friend of mine from Rochester and the Lake Placid Niner, I knew, whoa, people are constantly driving up here to hike. And when I hiked the 46 high peaks, which I did in one single summer because I finished it. Yeah, thank you. I finished working on a movie in May and then the next one started um, at the beginning of August. So it's like I had this two month window to like enjoy summer and normally summer I'm gone like forever. So it was like, holy crap, I'm actually going to be home this summer. I know when my next show starts, so I can actually take advantage. So I hiked the high peaks because again, a few months earlier, I had finally, I hiked that mountain and like, I didn't die. I felt great. It was amazing. So it opened up this door of adventure and of possibility. So a few months after I completed the high peaks, I thought, well, all these people are always come telling me that they come up on the weekends to hike in the Adirondacks. And my buddy over here, who's like obsessed with the Adirondacks, this whole thing, like imagine if when you're driving up to hike Giant and Rocky Peak Ridge or Cascade and Porter, like you could listen to a story about that mountain when you're driving up here. So all these things played into how the podcast was created. So I thought to myself, I said, there's lots of blogs online that people have done about their... 46er journey. You know, people research this and that. I said, I'm an audio guy by trade. Um, I listen to a couple podcasts. Imagine if there was like a podcast they could listen to while they're driving because I travel for work. So I have a lot of windshield time, which is why I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I thought if you could hike or listen to the mountain that you're about to go hike, that would be cool. And then what if you could binge this story start to finish and you finally had someone's like 46 or journey start to finish that you could listen to. So I said, okay, let's do it. So I start, it's fun, ready for this funny statistic. It took me longer to write, record and edit the season <laughs> than it took me to hike the high peaks. <laughs> so honestly, as a podcaster, I totally believe it. Yeah. yeah. It was funny because so starting, so the first season of my podcast was just like 17 episodes. Each episode was a different hike. Um, I wrote them, I recorded them, I edited them, and then I released them all at once, just boom, Netflix style. And I went on this one Facebook group that said, hey, I just cre started a podcast. You know, it's a, uh, here's a 46er journey, start to finish, enjoy. And I never had any desire to like do episodes after that. I just, it was almost like, it was like I did a documentary film, but instead of a film, it was a mm -hmm. podcast form. Like there was not supposed, it wasn't like starting a podcast. I just wanted to tell my story and have it available for people to listen when they wanted to. And then from there, I would just get messages like, this is awesome. And, you know, I got like 10,000 downloads in the first like month that it existed. Wow. But it was also because A, there were 17 episodes, boom, right at the get go. And like, you're not going to listen to just one, you're going to just like binge them. So it kind of like kick started quickly. Then I just kept doing it because people were like, I'd love to have more episodes. So then I did another season, which was the winter, because now it was the winter, uh, the winter, or I retold, I should say, I had already hiked it, but I retold the winter Lake Placid Niner, which is that hiking challenge. It just made sense. Okay. So we did the summer high peaks. Now how about the winter? And now that it created like, now I have sounds of snowshoes out there and crunching mm -hmm. through snow. And it was like a new experience. And then from there, I just like kept doing it. Uh, because I'm always out hiking. So I just kept doing it over the years. It has evolved. And I know it's a long winded answer, but I'm a podcaster, right? It evolved to having guests on like we're talking right now and it evolved to writing like these little campfire story episodes that have now turned into a book and, you know, all these different things, just like, it's just evolved very organically and it's found it's very diehard niche. And my whole show, you know, I, I make it a very, very big point that the show, the star of the show is the Adirondack Park. Like if I do an episode with a guest, I tell them flat out, like, you're not the star of the show. I'm definitely not the star of the show. The star, the point of us is to make the park the star. Like we're here to highlight what it does. We just have this like privilege to get to experience it. Uh, so I take that approach with it. And I think it's very, it's resonated with people because they love this park too. And it took me a long time to become aware that 
the Adirondacks is a thing like that. It's, it's, it's a tourist area. Yes. But it's like deeper than that for people. Like people get emotional when they cross over the blue line and they see like now entering Adirondack park sign and it's, it's wild, but there is, and as a, someone who lives here and grew up here, like when I finally started, you know, utilizing the outdoors and I travel for work, I get that same feeling. Like when I cross the line now, and I'm like, not even like, Oh, I'm back home now. It's like, no, there's something mysterious and like beautiful about this place that like, I can't put my finger on it, but it, it, it evokes emotion in people. And I think that's the, that's the beautiful part about this place. So if you've never been, uh, I highly recommend checking it out. I think it'll, it'll grab hold of you, especially if you're into the outdoors. If you don't like bugs, maybe not, it's probably not the place for you, but if you, if you don't mind them, it's the place. Well, if you're Canadian, you're also used to the bugs. It's kind of similar that way. Sure. Um, I do want to ask though, um, because I kind of want to share my experience too of my first time in the Adirondacks. But how many Canadians do you? Because every time I go, like half the parking lot is yeah. Quebec or Ontario plates. Like you must run into like a lot of your listeners must be Canadian. I would think. Yeah. No, definitely. I, and like Lake Plass and Niner, probably like fifteen twenty percent of finishers are Canadian. Um, wow. So a good amount. Like every every batch I have, I have I have to put at least one or two three stamp, uh, Canadian stamps out there. Like, no, it's, it's, it's a very, I mean, we're like, like you said, we're two hours South of Montreal. So this is a big hub in terms of bringing Canadians in. And then like out where you are in Ottawa, like you're not very far from the blue line. Like you're a little further from Lake Placid, but like to actually get in the park, you know, like that old forge area, I think would be much closer to you than Lake Placid. When you're driving from Ottawa specifically, you know, you're kind of just going through like rolling back backcountry roads and then you get to a point and you just know a there's a smell and b you can tell by the trees sure. there's like this certain part of the road because you're coming from west you're going east and you're driving into the park the trees get higher they're pine they're skinnier trees and then you can smell the pine as you're coming in that's how i know i'm there and then you start to then you start to see the like the rolling hill, hills become rolling mountains yeah right? So I know that feeling. And so when you're describing the like, it's a place, um, the first time I was in Lake Plaza, I was actually training for Kilimanjaro. And they're like, we're going to do Mount Marcy as a training hike. So Mount Marcy, which is the biggest high peak, not the hardest, but the biggest high peak was my first mountain, which was an exceptional experience. And I've been coming back since. But it's for me, it is my safe place. Like after I went through a big breakup, I, you know, I go there, it's my safe place. I go alone a lot. I did most of the high peaks alone. It is like my, my safe place. It makes me emotional. It feels like home away from home because I've been there so many times. And at this point, I'm only halfway done the 46ers, but I usually just go now, like I'm going for a cycling trip next time I go. Half the time I go now, it's not even to do a 46er. It's just to go enjoy, see what the weather's like, hike, maybe cycle. Like, honestly, now I just go for enjoyment and I know I'll get the 46 done at some point. Sure. You're just kind of immersing yourself in the park. And like, that's exactly what people say. Like, it feels like they're home away from home. It just feels like this other area that they can't really like describe. And it very much that whole, if you know, you know, it's very much kind of that sort of mentality because it's hard to articulate the emotions that it does bring out of people. And I think part of that is, yes, the fresh mountain air, the views, the fact that it is somewhat secretive, like people don't know about it, but yet it's the biggest protected wilderness in the United States. It's bigger than every national park. It's just like, it's this huge part of New York state that no one thinks about. So it is like, there is kind of a secret element to it. Even, you know, people in the Northeast don't know about it. If you know, you know, and you're kind of obsessed with it. And I think that's part of why so many people take this like ownership of it. And I love that when people say like, it's a home away from home for them because they take that ownership of it. And to me, that's, you know, okay, we have a, more advocates for the protection of this place that we all love. And I just happen to be able, able to call it home. And, and again, like, it feels like a different place than when I grew up. Like it's a totally different place to me now, despite having grown up in this town, it doesn't feel the same because it, an, an entire, you know, just world of adventure was unlocked for me by, you know, being able to actually experience it now and experience it uh, without feeling like death, if that makes sense. 
I completely get it. I can always tell how in shape I am by when I go to hike, hike in the Adirondacks. So here's the thing. People are like, oh, it's only like 4,000 feet. Mm-hmm. And people are like from out west who are like, oh, they're not even real mountains, blah, blah, blah. These mountains, and I want you to explain this, sorry. But explain what the 46 high peaks are and why they are so challenging. Because I would say that they are harder than hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. They are very challenging. Am I wrong? No, they they are. So it's funny. There's like plenty of memes out there on the internet about yeah. Western hikers, and it's kind of like an inside joke. There's a whole account for it, yeah. right? There's a whole yeah. Well, there's yeah. a whole there's like a joke about the like Western hikers that come to the Northeast, and it's just the Northeast in general because New Hampshire is kind of the same thing. But the 46 high peaks are 46 mountains in the Adirondack Park that are over 4,000 feet. A couple of them are just under, but that's a whole other story. But for <laughs> lack of a for just for just short to keep it short, uh, yeah, the the, the mountains over four thousand feet elevation. Now, with that though, some of the mountains you're climbing over three thousand feet of elevation just to get to the summit. What makes these mountains so challenging and difficult is the fact that the trails they suck. They're terrible. It's like the worst trail system in the world. But there's like the most amount of mileage of trails like any than anywhere else because. The trail system here is insane. How many, you know, how many miles? I wish I actually knew what the statistic is. I know the High Peaks Wilderness alone is over 350 miles, and that's just like one little sliver of the Adirondack Park. What makes them so challenging is when they cut these trails, like most of them, like a hundred years ago at this point, they just needed a quick trip up the mountain. So they just go straight up the mountain. They just go straight, like switchbacks aren't a thing. You just go up. So that's what gets you in really good shape. And that's why hikers here have a chip on their shoulder because they know I'm in really good shape because I can get to the top of this mountain. And then they go hike somewhere where, you know, you go out West where there's all these switchbacks and these like nice, gentle, lovely trails that take you all the way up the 14ers. And it's like, cool. How about we just like stop the madness and just go straight up so we can get to the top? Can we just like get to where the, are the roots? Can we just where get the to roots? the top? Where th- yeah. Yeah. Where are the rocks? Where are the roots? Where is it? Like, where's yeah. like, where's the scrambling? Where's the scrambling? So that's Sorry. really what Sorry. I know. I love the I love the passion, but that is really what it comes down to, and that that's why you know, with for me, you know, I train people to get into shape for hiking, and I take such a strength training element to it because the kind of common thought is like, oh, just go run, you'll be in good shape for hiking, and I just like scratch my head at that. I say, no, that's not. Maybe if you're like walking your dog on a trail in the woods. But like here, you need some athleticism and some actual strength because A, the trails go straight up the mountain. You're going to constantly be jumping, like climbing over boulders and climbing up ledges and, you know, grabbing onto roots and pulling yourself up by roots that are just like sticking out. And if the root breaks, like you're in trouble. Um, So it's just a different sort of animal and climbing the mountains here does require an athleticism for the reason of the trail goes straight up the mountain. You can't, it's not like a trail that, you know, switchbacks its way up the mountain and you can just like gently climb it. No, you're going to be huffing and puffing and huffing and puffing in a, in an enormous way. Let's take this outside. Now has a newsletter. Keep up to date with outdoor news, events, and great discount codes and deals from our partners. Sign up today at Let's Take This Outside. Ca. And there are parts too where I remember. Again, I haven't even done done them all yet. But there are parts. I think it was Gothics where I was by myself. The, the Gothics is one of the most epic mountains I would say in the range. There's points where you're going up this chain, and then there's parts where you have to like put your hands in very specific holds and your feet and very. You're kind of rock climbing. You're rock climbing a little bit. You're like, if I fall, I'm going to die. Like, yeah. if I fall at this point, I'm by myself. No one's going to know. But that's also why it's exhilarating, to be honest. Yeah. Because there's no, I would moments agree. where you're, right? Like, that's, there's that, there's that scared element. And the thing is, like, we're not trying to scare people away from the 46ers. We're just being like, this is the reality of what. Yeah. This that's is. just what it is. And, and again, like, 
I don't ever recommend someone just immediately go right to climbing high peaks, like go start climbing some smaller mountains in the Adirondacks first, like the Lake Placid Niner is just an example. Like you get an idea as to what hiking is like in the Adirondacks and what the trails are like, what the woods are like, how it kind of feels. There's so many options, but you're not wrong. Like there is, there's so many, so many sections in the, in the high peaks where I'll climb up it or I'll climb down it and look at it and just say, I can't believe we just go up and down these sections like it's no big deal. How are hundreds of people not falling a down lot of this? People. Yeah, but people fall, right? But like sometimes you come down a section and you turn around and look at it after you just like butt slid on your way down and gently, gingerly walked down this ledge and hoped you didn't slip and fall. And you think to yourself, I can't believe that this is normal. We just do this. We just go like Cliff Mountain for once or Allen Mountain. Like all these mountains have have these huge sections of just like ledges and it just, it's so normal though for a high peaks hiker. You just, but when you stop and take a step back, it's, it's, it's crazy that we just go up these and down these without thinking and for so, that somehow hundreds of people aren't getting really hurt every year, like on this exact ledge or that exact ledge, mm -hmm. but some, somehow we manage, I guess, somehow we manage. You have your own strength program for hiking, correct? You have your own strength program. You train people now for hiking specifically. Um, people can take a look at that, but also say people are just at home and be like, what can I do to be more prepared for hiking? Is it deadlifts? Like, what are you recommending for people? Because you're right, it's carrying a pack. It's yep. being able to navigate things, balance, strength. It's all of these and cardio. It's everything, right? Yeah, it's, you know, it's like a... Climbing mountains, especially here in the Northeast, it's like this weird combination of, you know, strength because you're going straight up the mountain. So your legs, your butt, your back, they all need to be strong. You need the athleticism to kind of help yourself get over the boulders or help yourself grab the roots and pull your body up the mountain or climb the saddleback cliffs. If you're in, you know, climbing the high peaks, like you have to be able to do this. Also, obviously the, the cardio that element to it too. Like you need to be able to handle breathing heavily for a longer period of time. So it's this weird hybrid. So I think in terms of training, I have found, okay, what gives you the most bang for your buck? I think squatting and deadlifting are two things that I program for everybody. Uh, the trap bar deadlift in particular would be my recommendation. And then squatting because the, you know, let's take a squat, for example, the weight is on your back. So your whole back, your core, your legs, your butt, and just your body working together to squat down and stand up. Like every muscle of your body is working together. You know, people think of squats as like a lower body movement, but it's really just a full body movement. And then the trap bar deadlift, kind of the same thing. You're picking something up off the ground. So your back, your butt, your glutes, your hamstrings, your knees, like everything are, everything are getting trained and getting stronger. So that allows you to be able to actually move in a way that's strong. And then you do lots of reps. So now you're training your heart rate too, and your lungs, and you're doing this under conditions that have you breathing heavily and lifting heavily. So you do that all at once. And now you're really training your body for anything you might encounter. So those would be my recommendations. And then, yeah, I throw a run in there once a week, do a deadlift day, do a squat day. And I also like to, to tell people to do a day where you're kind of doing like a body weight circuit. And the reason for that is people think of body weight training as like easy or like introduction when it's not really the case. Like it forces you to build the athleticism, to be able to move your body accordingly to move like an athlete, which is kind of what you're going to need. So if you train all of those things, you train for strength, you train your cardio and you train your like kind of athleticism. Yeah, you'll be set. And I think that's really what makes the difference and what helps people get in shape for this very specific activity of hiking because it is this hybrid of strength and high intensity interval mm -hmm. training because sometimes you're going in a steep section then it flattens out then it's steep then it flattens out and then just general conditioning because you know whether you're walking 16 17 miles on the road or you're walking into the mountains it's still 16 or 17 miles and you're wearing a backpack so you need to train that too so it just requires well i should shouldn't say it doesn't require anybody can get themselves up a mountain but the difference is like can you get yourself up the mountain and back and then at the trailhead feel great and feel ready to go to do another one and then tomorrow feel fine 
Or do you get yourself up to the mountain to summit, feel like death, get back to the trailhead, swear you'll never hike again, and then you're broken for the following week? Like that's why I say there's a difference between how your preparation will will have you prepared or not. Anyone can stumble their way up the mountain, but you could do it a lot more gracefully and with a lot more strength and fun too. And that's for me, like that's what changed it when I could suddenly get to the top of the mountain and back without, yeah, feeling like my life was over. That's the thing is you get to the top of the mountain, it's getting down is just as hard sometimes. I'd say it's harder on the body, actually. I actually yeah. was I was guiding literally on Friday uh, a client and we were talking about how we were climbing up this mountain called Whiteface Mountain, and the first like mile is straight, straight up. I mean, it's also the trail is like pin straight. It's just boom. There's no turns of any kind. And I was telling him like, I'll go up this all day long. It's coming down that ma- that is like physically painful because coming down hits the knees differently, and it it just hurts more. Whereas going up is, in my opinion, going up's harder on the lungs. Coming down is harder on the body. But also trekking poles help that. They help that a lot. I will say, and I'm not, you're not into cycling, right? I do. I am not, no. Whiteface specifically, you can walk up, you can physically, you know, you can hike up, mm-hmm. you can also drive up, um, you can cycle up, you can also ski up. It's one of those specific mountains that you, because it has a road, a toll yeah, road a toll up. Road, yeah. I've, I've climbed it on bike twice. I will say it's the worst, mm-hmm. but the best. But it's that feeling, but it's kind of the feeling at the top. But I will say that, Descending on a bicycle is way easier than <laughs> yeah. getting down. I wonder why that is. Getting- <laughs> That's so weird. That's so weird that you would think that. It's so strange. I was like, this is way I'm like, this is way faster. Why haven't why don't I bring yeah. my bicycle on every mountain? Right. I can't tell you how many times, uh how many times I've said I wish I had a bike right now to come down a mountain bike to come down the trail. A ski lift. Yeah, that would be good. No. It's yeah. weird that that's the um, way it is though. I have to ask, and you you might fight me on this, but what is your favorite and least favorite forty sixer? Hmm. My least, my least favorite is Cliff Mountain. Oh, what? That was fast. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have like a, I have like a, I have like a war with Cliff Mountain. It's just like the muddiest mud fest pit of all time. Uh, and also, the very first time I hiked it was just like a really terrible experience. And then I went back, and I still like hold a grudge against it. So that's why Cliff is my least favorite. In terms of my favorite, um, I don't know. I feel like. There's different elements I would choose. Like I like Cascade, for example, because it's super quick. Like I can get from the car to the summit in like one hour, just like running up the mountain. So that's an element I like because it doesn't involve all day. But in terms of like summit views, I would say like Algonquin would be probably my favorite in terms of the summit or Rocky Peak Ridge. Both of those are a lot harder to get to. And actually the climb up Algonquin. I don't really like it. I like it. It's in the winter. I like it better. The summer, it's like all these boulders. Whereas in the winter, that's like smoothed out with snow. So you know, there's different parts of different mountains that I like. Then there's Haystack, which is is gonna. It's like nine miles to get to the summit from the trailhead. So when I'm on Haystack, there's like a. It's one of my favorites because it's like a sense of in, of accomplishment because you are really far out here it's a long way to get to this summit. So like there's that kind of mysterious quality to it because you're so far from civilization. So there's different elements I like about different ones, but those are some uh, some that are great. And Big Slide is also one that it doesn't require the whole day, which I like. I'm very much like, I kind of tap out in that four hour range. So I like a mountain, I like a hike that's like four hours where most of the high peaks are way longer than that, which is why I tend to climb the shorter mountains more often because I can just zip up, zip down and continue on with my day. And they don't require nearly as much um, planning and prep. But mountains like Big Slide and Cascade, I probably go up the most because they don't require as much time and prep. But if I'm guiding, that's a different story. Or if I'm just like, I also make sure every year I'm always doing at least a few like big hikes, you know, just to make sure I still got it right. So like I have a list of like hikes and where I've done like what when I've done them yeah. and here's the thing the only ones I have left are the hard ones the multi day like multi hour ones that'll probably take me 12 to 15 hours to do like San, what is I don't even know how to pronounce half of them Santanini Santa, Panther Santanoni yep Santanoni and Kush I do Cooks Kraga Cooks and Allen and Allen so there's all I have left, this is very inside, but all I have left is these ones that are going to take me literally all day. I might have to camp. Yep. So I think that's what's holding me back at this point is because I haven't done a lot of 
big or hiking in a couple of years. So I'm like, okay, I got to get back, got to get back to that shape because I know it's going to be painful. It's gonna yeah. Be painful. I'll tell you though, you know, I, I, I say this on my podcast a lot. I'll take someone like you any day of the week over someone who's in really good shape, but has never climbed a mountain. Like I'd rather you who might even be in not prime mountain shape or even a little out of shape, but you've done this before, like you've been up the mountains before mm -hmm. over someone who's like a marathon runner who, you know, is in great shape, but has no idea about what mountain terrain is like, what it's like out there. I've had so many people uh, message me saying that like, they, 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 you know, run marathons and then they, they're, they just got their ass handed to them by the mountains, you know, when they're out here. So, and then I've had my, like my sister-in-law, for example, who's a 46er and, uh, her and her husband, who is my buddy, Josh, you'll hear his name on my podcast a lot. They did three mountains, um, like two summers ago. And she, she like is never in, never, she was, she was not in great shape at all, but she'd been there before. Like she had done it. So she knew what to expect. She knew how to pace her body. She knew how it hits her body, what, what it's like climbing a mountain. And she, she, yeah, it was hard. Uh, and she was sore, but she, but, but they did it. Like they did exactly what they planned. It was no big deal. Um, so that's why I say, I think the, the experience actually does trump the fitness level a little mm -hmm. bit when it comes to this sport in uh, sport, quote unquote, in particular. If people are visiting Adirondack Park, what can they do to make sure that they're taking care of it and respecting it and making sure that they're recreating responsibly or just making sure that they're able to even get a parking spot at some of the sure at some of the trailheads? Well, if you want a parking spot, start at four, sign in at four thirty in the morning. You'll never have a problem at any parking lot. That's my that's my kind of mo. Uh, but that's true. You're not exaggerating. No, at all. not at all. I I like to start early because I always say hours in the dark don't count. Because if you start at 4.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, you hike in for two hours and then the sun comes up, you're two hours into the, the hike and all of a sudden when the sun comes up, you turn the headlamp off, it feels like a new day. But look, I'm already like five miles in, six miles in, like I'm crushing. And then you look at your watch and you're like, you've already done two mountains and it's only eight o'clock in the morning. You're like, holy crap, this is awesome. And then also you'll always get a parking spot. I do like that. But I also like being in the woods as the woods like wake up. I think it's kind of fun. Mm. And for people who are too nervous to hike by headlamp, in like five minutes, it feels like it's just normal. Your eyes adjust, like you see everything in front of you. It's it's no big deal. And there's also there's nothing in these woods that are going to hurt you. There are no predators in the Anirondack Mountains. It's all like squirrels and occasional black bears, but you'll never see a black bear. If you do, you're lucky. Uh they are there though. But yeah, i I like to start at that hour and because you always find a parking spot, but you do need to get a permit to park at a trailhead called the AMR, which are, there's some high peaks that hike out of there. So you have to get a parking permit. No other trailhead in the Adirondack Park do you need any permit. You just first come, first serve. You just got to get there. And in terms of recreating and like treating the land well, um, you know, people like to like to shout, leave no trace. So there's that. You could just follow the leave no trace. Uh, protocols or just what I like to say is just kind of common sense and common courtesy. I feel like if you say, would I want someone to do X, Y, and Z to my property? Or if someone else was doing X, Y, and Z, would that bother my hike? Nine times out of 10, you'll be able to make the right decision. Smart. I like that. You've created the 46 of 46 podcast. You have an ebook. You know, you've started doing guided hikes um, and guiding. Where do you see things headed? Are you doing guided hikes often? Are you going to create more resources? Or because you have a lot going on right now, I do. There's uh, always something. I like I told you, I like to create things. Right, creating yeah. is the fun part. Uh, the other, the stuff after that is the least is the less fun part. But the creating stuff is that's enjoyable. What do you mean by where do I see things going? I def in terms of like what I'm doing. Yeah, in terms of what you're creating, in sure. terms of are you going to do you want to go more towards guided hikes? Because that's a whole other level of reward for you. Yeah, I mean, I've been guiding for a few years now. I got my, or actually, I guess longer than that now. I got my guide's license, um, I think in 2020. I just recently, like this past year, started these guided group hikes where you can just sign on my website and pick a date that we're going and just join us. Um, it's just an easier way to create a trip bring people together as opposed to the like the one-on-one, -on -one, hey, are you available to hike with me up X mountain X day? I prefer this sort of method. It's kind of fun. And the people who come on the guided trips too, it's like 
some of them are some of them are kind of nervous to go up certain mountains. Some of them are just sick of hiking solo and they don't mind spending some money to like hike with a group. You know, you get all sorts of different people and like every time they're, they're very, they're fun because you see the good qualities in humans. So like, for example, I've done, you know, we did a guided trip in the winter. There was five people plus me. Two of them were already Adirondack 46ers. One was a two time 46er. And one is almost a 46er, but they just wanted to like go with a group of people, right? They're tired of hiking by themselves. They're like, oh, this will be fun. Let's do this. And then like there's someone who was hiking his very first high peak. Literally none of them had any problem like slowing things down so that we're all sticking together. And you know, like, like it was just like you see people rise to the occasion in a good way. And then on the flip side, you see people kind of push themselves a little bit more and then they get to the summit and they feel so accomplished because- they were able to do something that if they were by themselves, they would have turned around. Like they would have, they wouldn't have persevered. Yeah. So you see kind of both ends of those spectrums and it's pretty exciting and pretty fun. But yeah, I, I like to do the guiding when it makes sense for my schedule, writing books. You know, I have the ebook. I have uh, another book called Adirondack Campfire Stories, which is an actual book. Um, that's just like a fun kind of uh, campfire story, spooky, spooky book. It's actually great for the fall. Now we're into like Halloween season. So now is a good time to, to read those fun stories but yeah it's just uh the guiding is the guiding is fun because you see all sorts of different people all coming together for the same exact goal which is to get up x mountain or to be with other people who like to explore the mountain so you get very like-minded people in that regard james thank you so much for creating the resources that you have and making hiking more accessible for people who are like i don't know where to start yeah i mean i i i have found that and it's happened very organically, my brand in a sense, with like the Lake Placid Niner, which is to us, you know, a hiking challenge with smaller mountains designed to get you in better shape so you can go hike a mountain or better prepared because it's like smaller mountains, slightly bigger mountains, slightly bigger mountains, slightly bigger. And it's just like you linearly work your way up. And then the podcast, like here's information to help you have a better adventure in the Adirondacks. And then the ebook. Here's everyone asks me the same questions every week. So I create, I wrote a book answering all of these questions. So here's the question. You're probably going to shoot me a message, pick up the ebook. It has the information you want. And now helping people train physically to get in shape, because as I told you before, we started talking like strength training is actually a bigger part of my life than even hiking. Um, mm. I'd say like strength training, 60% hiking, like 40%. So slightly bigger, but, uh, it is, it is slightly bigger in my life too. So it's like, oh, I can actually now help. I can also help you get in physical shape so you can enjoy the mountains. Like everything is so that you can have a successful adventure, um, here in the mountains in the Adirondacks or wherever you want, because if you're, if you're Adirondack ready, then you're ready for anywhere else. I wouldn't say I feel a calling. I would say this life chose me, uh, I always joke with my wife too that my I joke with her because I'm like a very business minded person, but I say my big heart is my biggest flaw because I'm just like I just give everything away. Oh, it's fine, you know what you need. It. Can this help you? Oh, fine, just take it, take it. I'll pay for it. Just take it. Like I'm very much that kind of mentality. Uh, obviously, with the podcast, the amount of hours it takes, and you understand like yeah. that you dedicate your time for strangers you don't know to uh, you know to do this. Like I literally have on Microsoft Word document behind this zoom call that we're on, uh, with an episode I've just finished writing this morning that I need to record now. And it's like, I'm just doing it because I feel like I'm supposed to now. And it's not even that I necessarily like take Lake Placid Niner, take the podcast. It's like, I feel an obligation and almost a duty to the Adirondacks now, because I've seen all the good that both that hiking challenge does and like the podcast does for people with helping people like yourself, like feel connected to the Adirondacks because they love it so much. So I feel like it, it is my duty to the park to help bridge that gap for people. So that's how I volunteer, I guess, in a sense. And obviously I've built it to bigger than things than I, I <laughs> thought originally, but yeah. kind of out of necessity um, because it does get so much time put into it. But I just feel like if I can help you do X, Y, and Z, then, you know, as a human, I should help you do X, Y, and Z. And we should all kind of take that mentality because everyone has something they can teach you. And I guess for me, I can help you, uh, explore these mountains. And so that's, uh, that's where I live, I guess. 
Thank you. And I have all the links. I'll put them in the show notes. Thanks, James. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we can go for a hike sometime. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'll see you sometime. Thanks for listening. For more Let's Take This Outside, go to letstakethisoutside.ca. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.